Mrs. Connell over here. Hi. How much money? Um, <laughs> the tickets are free. Tickets are free. Yeah, actually, even at free price, they're overpriced. You know, we're trying to pay people to come, actually. Uh oh. So this should be her introduction, and now we'd like to introduce our colleague Melissa Bell, who loses control. Who knows how to lose control? <laughs> yeah. She's our resident expert on control loss. So if you're having troubles maintaining control, don't listen. You don't need it. So this is going to be terrific. Okay. Uh, I would just redo the monologue if they came over. I spice. Restart. That's, that's up to you. That's the only option is yeah. to re restart or just uh, do it louder. And both are not not very satisfying. But oh, oh, yeah. these are the dry cleaning. Yeah. If you wash it by hand, then you have to um, 
dry it really flat. Yeah, but once the machine gets hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hand it down to my daughter. Oh, yeah? <laughs> say that again. I thought that I had problems. I think that's a so I think for him. Over there. Yeah. And he wants his own bag, too. The so last time I had some of your brownies, uh, wasn't that hard to learn? That's how I was with you. Hello. Hi, how are you? We might not have enough chairs the way this is starting to fill up already. Yeah. Maybe the room next to us can open. Hmm. I think David's in the bathroom. We're doing a rehearsal in front of the mirror. <laughs> Getting the expressions exactly the way he wants it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He says, uh, don't bother him. You get not that You'll be in there. Oh, look at this. Yes, sir. Yeah. No, wait. You say what? Do I know tsunami? I'm from uh, the place where came tsunami. Sendai? Near Sendai? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> very afraid. Yeah, very afraid. Very dangerous. Dangerous. I lost my relative, friends. Yeah. Relatives, friends. Ah, sorry. 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 <laughs> so soon, one year later, March. 11 yeah. so yeah. one week yeah. one week yeah. Yeah. your friend did you disappear or did you find you made it yourself you found you find never find very sad So you 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 gone outside at night and looked for the tube. Oh yeah. I mean I don't know about here, but I mean I go back home. Yeah, as a matter of fact, one time I can't remember with some people on the house they went to the theater harbor and they had this kind of really strong um, uh, 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 set up with the uh, 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 I'll bet you guys you made the other house go back and look around your own Yeah, I did. We did go on top of our roof at school and look at stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's where I grew up. But um, this was actually even after I graduated. This was like years later. As a matter of fact, my son was already born and he went with me. He was like, has he picked up your love of astronomy? No. Just your child? There's lots of stars in the
It's an exercise for demos. No, it's they're testing the giant voice. They're testing the giant voice. They've updated the giant voice and they're testing it. So if there's nothing wrong, if you hear it a number of times, we don't have to labor anything. It's okay. Numerous times? Yeah, it's going to go on for quite a while. Uh-oh. What's wrong with that? No. What is that? That's what we were told to work. Because yeah, he's paranoid that there's going to be five pages. Yeah. Well, I know it has one. Oh, okay. Nice to see silent, hidden world, deeper and more truthful than our own. In Gauguin's islands, an illuminated innocence that mocks all of our codes, our social relevance, our high ideals. Absent nights led to immaculate mornings filled with practice and instruction, ideas and intellect, models. And technique. I was made in Paris, but I found myself in the provinces. The furious everlasting sun beats down on everything I see, always, always rising in the east. I wake with contentment, sweating, 
yawning, taking in oceans full of eye-piercing light. That haystack over there is not just a bunch of straw. It's yellow gold soaking up energy. And down there, those giant green cylindrical cypresses, they're being pushed by a swirling tide of air that's and continues stroking the petroleum paint. Fossil organisms are mixed with crushed pigment and spread like butter on this permanent bread of finely woven cloth. I am defying entropy. I am raising a hell of existence to living heights. I'm not just perceiving reality. I'm creating it. And the hot sun gains radius, beats down on my meager brain, making me receptive to what's alive. And then suddenly I see that everything green-brown is also orange-blue and animated. Because all life is holy. I've been doing this for days which turn into weeks, maybe months. I don't know, I can't tell exactly. I wake up with the coffee strong, aromatic, permeating. I picture the world, I paint the wind. Between those giant cypresses and that, that golden haystack, currents of air in a rush of water-like ripples descend and sweep over the bending pines from hill to hill. Smooth, deep currents, cascades, falls, and swirling eddies sing around every tree and leaf like mountain rivers conforming to the features of their channels. I am in love with life. I burn into the afternoon, my colors, the distillation of lust and living, hardening fast before twilight, singing the night electric, cuts me off. Now I'm in the cafe, drinking in the acid sweat of workers' labors. Bread and wine, with maybe a peach for dessert. That's my dinner. Soon, I'm out the door, and on another adventure. And I'm out under the high heart of stars. The night is electric, with swirling traces of fine wind, and the ghostly glow of other worlds that inhabit this sphere, just a little left of center. If man's two-sided brain were fused, we would see things like this. Silent cry of millions of years of human inhabitation spreading out in a sprinkling of fairy dust, blowing like leaves around one field and then another. Listen, beyond the constant chirp of crickets and the thunderous skies is the sound of the spears. Listen, it is a low crystal humming which is the earth turning in space. Nothing's ever lost, everything transforms, it morphs into something new. Wow, the night truly is alive with wonder. The blue-black trees know the stars that ignite our imagination know. They never doubt, for if they did, all of life would go out. They know there is no sin except wasting the day and denying the night. I'm just an observer on my way to another life. One that's beyond this one, just a little left of center. Just as a train is our vehicle across the terrestrial landscape, art is our vehicle to the stars.
Thank you. <laughs> and thank you that the jets weren't flying. <laughs> they didn't dare. So for the second part of my presentation, I would like to talk to you about the seven fine arts, which are painting, sculpture, architecture, poetry, dance, drama, and music. So this is this is a classic sense of the, what the fine arts are. And it's what was derived from Aristotle and, and the Greeks 2,400 years ago. So what is fine art? First, some examples, just to orient you. OK, painting, yes, think of the French Impressionists. They were fine artists. Monet, Gauguin, Van Gogh, and, and the others. Why, why would they fight? What, so what, what, is, what is fine art in painting? Fine art in painting, as with all the other arts, is conceived for aesthetic pleasure or effect. Aesthetic pleasure or effect. So it's not sensational, necessarily. Sculpture. Think Michelangelo. Right? I was fortunate enough as a teenager to see Michelangelo's Pietà uh, at St. Peter's in Rome, right before it was smashed with a hammer by a, some maniac. But it's still there, I think, maybe behind plexiglass. So we think of sculpture, fine art sculpture, as being beautiful, which the, certainly is the Pietà and uh, David, uh, by, also by Michelangelo. But also, Giacometti's sculptures are fine art, too. They're quite different. So Giacometti sculptures are rather horrific. They're emaciated, dark figures. And I uh, saw them in San Francisco, of course. But they weren't exactly beautiful. What they were instead was a gateway to the sublime. They were so chilling that they made you feel something. And that's an aesthetic experience, too. Architecture. Well, you just have to take a trip to Europe and walk through one of those, those beautiful cathedrals. Those, those are fine art pieces of architecture, the wonderful cathedrals of Europe. I'm sure the Taj Mahal is too. I've never been there, but that's, that's a fine piece of architecture. And in our modern time period, the, the buildings of Frank Lloyd Wright and, and his houses too. If you've ever been inside of a Frank Lloyd Wright structure. And there's one, even one in Tokyo, uh, mm -hmm. still down there. If you walk in, you sense something different. It has an effect on you. That's what fine art does. Poetry, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the performing arts, dance, drama, and music. Well, of course, ballet is a, is a fine arts form of, of dance. And some of you have been to ballet and and some still have to experience that. Also, modern dance, like Martha Graham, okay? Martha Graham is modern dance. It's, it's a, a hybrid of traditional work. But what makes dance fine art is that it's choreographed. There's a plan to it. So when you experience it, when you, when you see modern dance that's fine art or ballet, it's choreographed and there's a controlling consciousness that comes through it. And then you have music. Well, of course, um, Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, yes, those are the, the traditional composers. Philip Glass, have to wait a hundred years. Mm -hmm. have no idea. Uh, so what about music? Okay, again, it's, uh, it's planned. And as much as I love jazz, I wonder if it is a fine art. Again, time will tell. Maybe there's some standards in jazz that will still be around in a hundred years, and maybe they will be fine art, but we just don't know yet. So music is, is a fine art. A drama, of course, is a fine art. But to experience the fine art of drama, you won't get that 
on TV or on the internet or even in the film. It has to be on stage. Drama as a fine art has to be done by actors live. Poetry, this is in the very traditional sense. The Greeks called literary arts poetry. So their plays were conceived in a, in a poetic style. But for us, it's literature. And there are plenty of novels that would be fine art, too. So what do these have in common? And how do we experience fine art? Well, you experience it in person, not on film, radio, TV, the I with an iPod or internet. You're not experiencing fine art. You're experiencing renditions of it, maybe. Painting. In order to really appreciate a painting, you have to see it in a museum. So you know what I mean, those of you who have visited museums. What you're seeing is the actual mark of a great painter. There's their work, and you're seeing it in person. And some paintings have relief. It doesn't transfer on a two-dimensional medium. And you're having a connection with the, with the artist. Vicarious, though it is, you're still experiencing their, their art one-to-one. -one. Same thing with, with sculpture. To actually see it in three dimensions is, is a whole different thing than seeing it in two dimensions. Architecture, you have to walk into it. You have to experience fine art in the performing medium, live. So that's how we experience it. Poetry. Well, it's a, it's a literary art, so I'm afraid not many of us spent a long time of the day or night engaged in reading poetry. I mean, some of us do. Some of us write it. However, when I was in university, we would go to poetry readings, and a lot of us would say, to understand really what the artist's intent is, you have to hear them read their work. So I would say to experience poetry as a fine art, you need to, you need to hear, hear it in a reading. Poetry slams are something different. They're too sensational. It's, it's the modern uh, equivalent of a reading. And from what I can tell, what's being conveyed in a poetry slam is not contemplative. It's rather in your face and sensational. Although, who knows? It could develop into something else. So that's what they all have in common. How do we experience fine art? We, we engage in it live, in person. The last question is why? Why experiencing fine art? I think the reason is that it's an antidote to, to the high-tech culture that we're constantly bombarded with. Every day we wake up and turn on the internet. And uh, that is if the cell phone doesn't wake us up first. So I encourage you to attend a dance, a, a dance concert or a symphony, listen to the symphony orchestra in Hachinoe. Or the next time that the London players come to visit Misawa, check them out. I guarantee you uh, a, a clipped modest rendition of Hamlet over there in the Mokoteki Theater is ten times better than anything you could see on film or TV. Thank you. I turn, now I turn it over to our high-tech expert, uh, somebody who's... Yes. <laughs> Sponsored by the International Internet Security um, Consortium. There's two more letters in there, it's so a long ISC2, and uh, childnet.org. 
and um, they go around to to schools throughout um, the United Kingdom, Hong Kong, the United States, and uh, uh, one more Western country, New Zealand, I think, and uh, talk to kids aged 11 to 14 about safe use of the internet. And so, um, of course, I don't have anyone in here age 11 to 14, I don't think, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, what I'm going to talk to you all about is some um, information that has been gleaned from this particular program by talking to the kids. So um, what I'll have is uh, 10 tips for you, for you as parents for how you can help your kids um, surf the internet better. But first of all, um, but before I talk about this, let me ask how many of you all have children at home? So if you, okay. So, um, well, even if you don't have children or if you're uh, going to have children soon, this is still important for you um, to know this information because not to steal from uh, the late Whitney Houston, but the children are the future. They are going to live in this internet world that we've created. And so um, it's our duty to protect them and teach them how to navigate this world. They can't, it's too late for them to try to not be part of it. So, um, the, uh, so I told you uh, everything on this already. So Canada, that was the other question. So um, here's a few statistics to start off with. First, um, the first statistic which I got from the, um, the uh, IEEE magazine Security and Privacy, a study by Carnegie Mellon found that out of 42,000 children um, under the age of 18 in this database, um, 4,300 of them had their social security number already stolen by um, someone and used. And you can see the two, uh, two of the scarier statistics one um, child who was 17 had eight people already stolen um, his social security number and racked up $725,000 worth of debt. And then um, the 14-year-old uh, with a 10-year credit history, you know, so that had been going on since he was four. Um, and then uh, another study by the um, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. This study is about 10 years old, so um, it's, I'm sure it's gotten worse since then. But uh, I have to refer to my notes on this one because there's so many. Um, so first, in their study they found of um, youth that use the internet regularly, one in five had received some sort of um, sexual advance over the internet. And then um, one in 33 had received aggressive um, sexual um, assault. So um, sexual, not assault, sexual advances such as um, receiving gifts or having a person try to meet them. And this was 10 years ago, so I imagine that it's worse now. Um, and then 1 in 17 had been harassed in some way via the internet. And now um, that's about the victims. The interest, some interesting information about the actual um, people um, doing these things. So um, half of the, uh, of the advances were actually from um, other kids. And then a quarter of them were from females. So um, that's sort of uh, unusual from what you would expect. So um, now that I've given you some statistics to um, make you think about it more, especially for children, I'll start with the um, 10 tips for your, um, parents. So the first tip is that you need to talk to your children first. And um, even if your children are not 11 or um, internet age yet, you should start talking to them about um, the risks of um, internet use. And um, the, main use, the main risk that uh, we talk about is illegal download of music. So 50% um, of the kids that were um, talked to throughout the Safe and Secure Online program admitted to downloading music, um, well, uh, music, movies, or games illegally over the internet. So, um, and I know uh, it's, when I teach the um, IFSM 201 class, I uh, um, ask students about that, and um, many of my students admit also to downloading music illegally. So, um, it's hard probably to convince the parents to tell the kids not to do it, but they might do it too. But um, it's actually a very risky behavior to download music illegally. Not just because it's illegal, but it's actually risky for your computer. So when you use these um, sites like Kazaa or um, BitTorrent, you're actually opening up what's called a peer-to-peer -peer network with computers of people that you don't even know. And you're basically erasing your um, firewall and virus protection at that time and allowing them access to your computer. So the risks. One thing is that you'll receive often um, not the actual file that you wanted, because this is not a big risk, right? You wanted the Lady Gaga song, but instead you get Spice Girls. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the next risk, of course, is more important. That's that you might um, download spyware, 
um, a Trojan or um, a virus onto your computer. And then finally, when you do that, like I said, you're opening your computer to other people. So they can get um, other information off of your computer at the time that you have that um, going. So I have a, just for effect, I'm going to do this for the um, kids. This, uh, so here I am downloading this illegal song here. Hi. I'm going to download it because I want the Lady Gaga song to go over my computer. <laughs> so this is uh, just a, um, it's, I'm not really putting a virus on the college computer. <laughs> 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 I think, I hope. <laughs> no, I can uh, escape. But, um, I was going to do it anyway. So, um, I'll let it run through, but so uh, and usually it's going to run through and then it'll disappear. And you, often when you download um, malware onto your computer, um, it, it hides in the background to make sure your computer will run normally. And meanwhile, somebody's there stealing your bank account information and so on. So there's the leading evidence in the story of the system. And then now I can close it. So it's okay. I promise that nothing bad is. If it, I didn't do it. <laughs> okay. Um, on the, more on this idea of talk first. So now you explain the risks to your kids, but you also um, want to give them some good um, tips on how to protect themselves. So the first thing you want to tell kids is to never give away their password. And um, the kids at the high school, I know they give away their locker combination to each other. So, um, you know, to them to give away a password is not a big deal. But someone's your BFF today, you give her your password tomorrow, she might be. Um, you know, your new enemy, so you, she's got your password and uh, information through your account. So um, always, you can teach them how to choose a tough password, and there's, I don't have time to talk about how to choose a tough password in this class, but um, you guys watch the AFN commercials, right? <laughs> and then um, remind them about phishing, so banks and um, websites will never ask for them to um, verify their login information on the um, email. And then, um, of, tell them to be careful who they trust. Once they have an email account, um, if they get a, uh, an email with an attachment from someone, they want to think about two things. One is, do they know who the person who sent the email is? And then secondly, would that person send them that attachment? So, um, you know, my example is that, uh, of course, they probably get an email from Grandma, but is Grandma going to send them an attachment that says, hey, check out this hot new Lady Gaga video? So probably not. So um, tell them to think about that. And avoid chain emails. The kids like to, um, to send chain emails a lot. They're just participating in spam if they do that. All right. So the next second tip is um, to um, limit social networking. And um, by limiting social networking, you're, um, of course, all the kids now, at least in the high school, I think are on Facebook. There's not much you can do about it. But um, if you didn't know, in the United States, the Child Online Privacy Protection Act of 2000 limits what kind of information that uh, websites can collect on children under 13. And for that reason, a tool such as Facebook does not allow children under 13 to join. However, I know children who are 8 to 10 years old who have a Facebook account, right? So how do they have that? <laughs> they lied, right. Or, and, and usually, how, how do they come up with the idea to lie? Often their parents sit there and tell them, okay. just say you're 15. You know? so, um, but there's a reason for not allowing this information to be collected on children. So, um, you know, they're too young to know how to behave in this situation, um, what kind of friends to accept, and things like that. So I really urge you to um, not let children under 13, and um, really I would say wait until about 15 or so to allow kids to um, participate in social networking. Um, another, um, it's interesting that, um, I got it um, ahead of myself, so um, there's this network, and I have a um, slides for a copy of the uh, references for you guys at the end. So this um, reference right here, digizen.org, it's created by an 18-year-old um, kid, and so it's written with some uh, information on how to um, properly participate in social networking in a way that kids would appreciate, not feel like they're being told this by adults who don't know how it is. So. Okay, now I have a, a really quick video. I shouldn't go over my 20 minutes. No, thank you. It's cool. Um, this is, um, it's called Once You Post It, You Lose It, <laughs> and so I know we talked about losing it earlier. <coughs> so, um, see if I can make it big. Excuse me. 
Stacy, the girl, put that picture of her up on the bulletin board. Um, <coughs> sensible behavior. So um, when your kids, it's a, this is sort of more about keeping an open discussion. And um, so talk to your kids about things like cyberbullying and make sure that they know to report it. I know here in Masawa at the schools, they take cyberbullying very seriously. So if a, a kid reports cyberbullying to the school, then um, you know, they can verify it. Then the, the children who are responsible will be suspended. So. Um, Encourage the kids to um, ask for guidance and discuss things with you. So you see here in that study I talked about earlier, only 25% of the kids who were approached sexually on the internet told their parents. And then a fraction of those parents even bothered to tell authorities. So, um, and uh, when they interviewed the parents, they said only 17% had an idea of who to talk to. So um, I have some references in the, um, up here for you, but also I talked to the NCIS here in Misawa and um, they said that if you feel that there's been some sort of criminal uh, behavior on the internet, you can call the 35th um, Security Forces Squadron, um, their um, help desk, and they will take care of it right away. So um, they'll take it seriously. And then another um, website here for kids is the um, Child Net Sorted website, and it has um, tips for kids on just how to protect their computer in general. All right, um, so here's one of the tips that I think is most important. The, um, computers do not belong in children's bedrooms. They need to be um, in an open area, a family area, where the parents can see what they're looking at. And also, um, you, know, you don't need to sit over their shoulder, but if they c come across something that uh, makes them uncomfortable, if they're in their room by themselves, they might just um, deal with it. If you're right there, you know, watching John Stewart on TV, they might say, hey, mom, look at this. So, um, so um, and of course, this, this, the statistics from the study, so they said 85% of kids have computers in their room, and 75% admitted to being online after 11 on a school night. So they should be sleeping that time anyway. Just be a mean, mean mom like me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the next tip is that you can't rely on parental control. That, does anyone have like a net nanny or parental control on their computer at home? So, um, well, they... Uh, um, they work for little kids to keep them from seeing things that they um, accidentally, but the older kids can figure out how to get around them. And I know this at the high school, they're always putting up new um, programs, for that nanny type programs, and the kids are getting around them. The teachers are like, I can't get to my YouTube anymore. The kids are like, well, just do this. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's better to educate them on their behavior than try to block them. And so um, the third reason why you can't rely on parental controls also is um, that you have to remember that now the internet is ubiquitous. They, they, have, uh, they have internet access on everything from their cell phone to their, um, to their <coughs> devices to their music players now. So you can't really just um, block stuff at your computer at home. They need to know um, how to treat the um, devices all the time. And then um, it's true that the um, online gaming devices 
are, have become a major target for cyber predators, especially targeting young boys. So um, they, um, you, know, you need to keep an eye on that for your kids. All right, um, would have been a playground bully. We'll um, join in on a cyberbullying episode against one kid just because um, everybody's doing it. So, um, and then I don't know if you guys have heard about sexting, but that's uh, where kids will send each other racy um, texts that they would never say to the person face to face, you know. And then um, that sort of leads up to situations that they just don't want to be involved in. Um, also, they found out that um, students are doing more sophisticated attacks on their teachers, actually creating face, um, fake Facebook profiles on the teachers to uh, try to discredit the teachers. So, um, that uh, one thing that you can definitely teach your children is that it's okay to unfriend people. And um, if they're like us, I have a few family members that post up on Facebook that I don't agree with, so you can also hide people without hurting their feelings. And, um, if someone's become a real problem, there's a way that you can actually block a person um, from ever seeing anything that you post. They won't even be able to find your name, and you will never see anything that they post. So Facebook has that ability. And um, if, I don't have time to explain it today, but if you ever want to do that, all you have to do is Google or um, Yahoo or search how to um, block someone from seeing your Facebook at all. It's pretty easy to do. Okay, and number nine is uh, that reputations matter. It's, um, of course, um, our Facebook reputation matters, right? I have a Facebook page that makes me look way cooler than I am in person. But, um, and so the kids, uh, um, kids are the same kind of thing. But what, uh, what we mean here is that what they do, their internet um, and social networking behavior right now, is going to have an impact on them in their future. If you have a 16-year-old kid now who's posting stuff, He's going to apply to college next year, right? And the colleges are looking at that, especially the more prestigious colleges and scholarship programs. And employers are looking at it. And then, um, you know, 10 years from now, he goes for, um, for a security clearance. And they look back 10 years for a security clearance. And they do look at your social networking behavior. So um, the kids need to know that. All right. And then lastly, number 10 is uh, that... Um, if uh, all else fails, tell your kids that their behavior can have an impact on the parents and your family. So again, I was talking about the um, pirated videos, music, and um, games. So those peer-to-peer -peer networks are really a very bad thing to get into. And um, so they can open your computer to cyber attacks and um, open, um, allow malware to be loaded onto your computer so that your identity bank account information, and even if you have company information on your computer, it can be stolen. And um, your, your broadband can be blocked. I know Verizon has in your policy, if you sign it, um, well, we all have to sign it or we're not going to get Verizon, <laughs> that um, if you are found um, guilty of downloading uh, illegal music and so, so on, that they will cut your um, connection off. So, um, and of course we all know in the military it's uh, important for our kids to understand that um, what they post can be a threat to the actual military mission. So that's it. That's my references. And um, so that's all I have for you guys. I have copies of references up here if you want. And then, so next we have, we're going to the stars with Dr. Ewing. So. I'm usually pretty comfortable talking to a group of people. However, I don't know how I can possibly follow those first two talks at all. Uh, it's a little bit fitting that my topic comes after those two topics because my topic is a bit of a marriage of those two topics. First, in astronomy, we do it because we're awestruck and we attempt to attain the higher feeling of aweness and mystery about the universe as we look out there that uh, David was illustrating is uh, everyday behavior for an artist. He lives in that space. We also try to attain those very elevated feelings about what's out there. But we can't explore or find out anything about what's out there without our telescopes and computers. So we're totally technologically based. So we try to put the, both the two together, and sometimes we lose touch a little bit 
we get so wrapped up in the mathematics and the computers that we forget to just say, wow. And sometimes we just say, wow, and we forget to solve the equation. So we do have a foot in both worlds in this respect. I'd like to try to blow your mind three or four times today. That's my goal, anyway. So the first one would be that tonight you might go out and look up and say, wow, the stars are bright tonight. The stars are beautiful. But then you might say, do I really know anything about the stars tonight? Because the light that you are looking at from that particular star took four years to reach your eye. It's as if you had a friend that wrote you a letter and said, today I'm having a very good day. So you go to the post office and you get the letter and it says, I'm having a very good day today. And you look at the postmark and it was written five days ago. It took five days for the letter to reach you. So you've got no idea how your friend is today, whether they're even alive or well, or what they've done at all in the last five years. And the same is true of that star that you look at and say, wow, that star is beautiful tonight. Sorry. You've got no idea about what that star is tonight. And you've got absolutely no idea what that star did for the last four years. It could even be totally disappeared. And you wouldn't know it until four years after it disappeared, because it takes that long for the information to travel to you. So enjoy your delusion. <laughs> and you might say, well, that's, that's only one faraway star. Oh, well, more bad news. That's our closest star. <laughs> the others are farther away. <laughs> we have stars that our newest information is a hundred years old. And that's also in the neighborhood. And we have stars that are a hundred thousand years old. And we even have stars that our latest information is a million years old. This is very good in one way, and it's very bad in also the same way. This is called the look-back time, because as you look out in space, because it takes time for the information to travel across these vast regions of space and reach you, you're looking back in time. You're seeing things as they used to be, because it takes that much time for the information to reach you. For example, our sun is eight light minutes away. That means it took eight minutes for the sun to send the light and for it to reach the earth. So the sun could have disappeared seven minutes ago and you're still enjoying your suntan and then all of a sudden it goes out. And you say, oh, the sun just disappeared. Well, it disappeared eight minutes ago and that was as soon as the information could reach you. So as we look back in time, and by the way, the farthest back that our technological telescopes and computers can now look is three billion years. We can look that far back in time and we can see, in, see the universe the way it was three billion years ago. Now that has a good and a bad side. One, we would really like to know what's way out there today. There could be some cool dudes out there, but if they tried to tell us they were cool, then it's going to take three billion years for us to find out that they were cool and we might not really I don't care anymore, and we won't, for other reasons I'll go into. So this look-back time is very bad because we don't know what's currently going on in the universe. It could get you a little nervous. Anything could be happening out there, and there's no way could we could find out about it until much, much later. But the good side of it is we get to see ourselves the way we used to be. Because we can assume that that part of the universe is very much like our part of the universe. So if that's the way they looked three billion years ago, that's also the way we looked three billion years ago. So it's really a history video. As we look back in time, we're just looking back in different eras, to way back to the very beginning. So it's made to order for that. It's disturbing that we don't know what's going on out right, right now, but in no other science do you get a ready-made history book for you? The farther you look out, the more back in history that you're going. So it's very, very good that way. But there is a limit to this. And we're very near the limit right now. 
because that is, you might not know this, but it's true. Um, 15 billion years ago, <clears throat> this many years ago, 15 billion years ago, you might remember it for reasons I'll also get into in a moment. 15 billion years ago, there was nothing. Absolutely nothing. No molecules, very few atoms, no Earth, no Sun, no galaxies. There was absolutely nothing. It was the beginning of everything. And then, once the machine got started, then atoms started to form, molecules started to form, planets and suns started to form, galaxies started to form, all very, very slowly over time. But 15 billion years ago, there was nothing. It hadn't started yet. So the universe as we now know it did have a definite beginning. And it was 15 billion years ago. So as we look out and improve our telescopes, what are we going to be looking at when we get such a good telescope that we can look back 15 billion years? What are we going to see? Nothing. Nothing. Because that's the way it was then. So no matter how much better than that our telescopes get, it's sort of wasted, isn't it? So there's a limit to how far back we can, how far out we can look, because when we look out, we're looking back in time. And there's a limit to how far back in time we can look, because that's when it all started, 15 billion years ago. So we sort of have a built-in limitation. It takes a little bit maybe of the fun out of it, but it's still very exciting to see what happened very, very far out there. The next point to address, and this could be a little sensitive, is that you are nothing. Absolutely, the nearest thing to nothing that there absolutely could be. You might say, well, you know, I can to be nothing. I'm solid. I'm standing right here. You are composed of atoms. True? You are composed of atoms, and the atom has material in it. But the material in the atom is in such an unusual arrangement that it basically adds up to nothing. If we look at one particular atom, then the atom has a center point. The center point is extremely, extremely small. But yet the center point contains 100% of the material, the mass. It's all squeezed together in that little point. And then, very, very, very far away, is a shell. The shell prevents other atoms from getting into that region. It gives some structure to it. But the shell is very, very light. It has almost zero mass. Almost all of the material is contained in that little dot. But other dots or other atoms cannot approach ins inside the shell. So, it's sort of like a room full of balloons. And inside each balloon at the center is a little dot of matter. So, the balloons give the illusion of structure, true? Because the balloons pile up on each other. So, these atoms pile up on each other. They can't penetrate. They're like bubbles. So, they give some structure to yourself. But if you go inside each atom, between the outer shell and the little dot at the middle is nothing. And this distance between the outer shell and the little dot is 100,000 times the size of the little dot. So 100,000 times is empty, and one out of 100,000 is something. So you are totally nothing. You're just these little dots. And the solidity of your structure is only because your eyes are so bad, you can't see this level of detail. If you could, you would say, yeah, I'm nothing. So I'm going to give you some idea of the perspective. If this was the dot in the middle of one atom that contained all the material, we would call it the nucleus. If this was a dot in the middle, of one atom, then how far away would the shell be? Well, if I put this dot in the middle of Misawa Air Base, then the shell of electrons would be the fence around Misawa Air Base. 
and there'd be nothing in between. So this atom is 100,000 times emptier than it is full. So all this material is in this little dot at the middle, and all of the atoms are exactly this way. So uh, the reason that you appear to have structure is that these balloon shells cannot penetrate each other. But inside each balloon, well, you say, isn't there air inside? No, we're talking about much smaller than air molecules now. We're talking about the atoms that make up the air molecules. So it's the purest thing to a pure vacuum that you're ever going to experience. So once you see these guys so proud of what they got, they go to the gym, they buff up, and solid bulk. No, it's nothing. <laughs> So the next thing to talk about is our sun. Um, if this is our sun, then the earth is, the sun is a thousand times larger than the earth. The sun is a thousand times larger than the earth. It's huge. The sun is a gas ball. It's gas all the way through. It's not solid at all. Then you say to yourself, why doesn't the sun collapse? It will. Just give it time. You might also ask yourself about the Earth. You know that all masses attract other masses. It's called gravity. That's why you don't fly off into space, because the Earth attracts you. But you have to ask the question, if the Earth attracts me, why doesn't the Earth attract itself? and squeeze down into a point. Because there's a resistive force, and that is the structure of the Earth. The Earth has structure that prevents it from following its own flow of gravity and collapsing into a single point. If you remove that structure, it would collapse into a point. It's as if I took this golf ball and said that this is the Earth. Now, if I squeeze it hard enough, I cannot make it go into a point, because why? It has structure, and the structure resists. But if I took that structure away, all of the material is very, very tiny, and all I'd have to do is squeeze it down into a point, and sort of watch it disappear away. So it's the structure that prevents the gravitational collapse of the Earth, the Sun, and everything else. Now, the Sun is a gas ball. So you say, well, in the gas ball, what's the structure that prevents the collapse? Well, at the middle of the sun is a furnace. And it's burning nuclear fuel, creating light and energy, thank goodness, that comes out to us. So you know that hot air rises and it creates pressure. So it's the pressure of the nuclear furnace in the center that keeps the sun from collapsing in on itself. It's sort of like the air in the middle of this. This doesn't have any structure in the inside. It's just an empty ball. But there's some gas there, too. And the gas exerts pressure and prevents me from crushing this into a point. So a gas will do the same thing if it's hot enough and under enough pressure to prevent gravity from self-collapsing the sun into a point. But what happens when the sun runs out of fuel? and his furnace goes cold. Gravity has been waiting for that moment. Because when that moment comes, it's fine. It's going to collapse the sun. That will happen in five billion years. You watch. <laughs> and remember who told you. And then you owe me a dinner. In five billion years, the sun will run out of fuel. And when the furnace goes cold, gravity is going to suck it down. Now, how small will gravity suck the sun down to? It will suck the sun down to a size that is about the size of our present Earth. About 4,000 miles across the middle. So if you take the mass of the sun, which is a thousand times bigger than our Earth, and you squeeze it down to the size of the Earth, you think it might get a little bit more dense, the same amount of material in that smaller space, and it would be very, very dense. In fact, once the sun collapses to that size, if you took a teaspoonful of it, that material, this much, 
it would weigh five tons. Five tons. Probably break the spoon. <laughs> so that's the fate that awaits our sun, to shrink down that small. However, there are larger suns than ours. There are suns that are even a hundred times the size of our sun. And when they start collapsing, they don't stop when they get to be the size of our Earth because they've got too much material. So the force of gravity is even stronger. So they just keep right on collapsing. And when they end up collapsing, then they're very much smaller. So what you've got is a star that started as a hundred times the size of our sun, and it end up, ends up collapsing into a little ball that's six miles across. Six miles across, the size basically of Masala Air Base. So an entire star, a hundred times the mass of our sun, collapsing into a region that is six miles across. So how dense is this material? Well, that material, if I took a teaspoonful of that material, it would be 100 million tons. A <laughs> hundred million tons, tons. That means if you drop, put it in a teaspoon, not only would it break the teaspoon, it would go through the earth and come out the other side. There's <laughs> nothing going to stop it. It's that dense. So these stars, when they reach that degree of collapse, um, the reason that they collapse to that small minute is because each atom loses all of its buffer space. And the center point of each atom is touching the center point of the next atom. So the, uh, the center points, the nuclei, are absolutely touching. So it is one solid nucleus. Something interesting happens when a star shrinks down that small. And it's the same thing interesting that happens to figure skaters. Our sun rotates. It goes around, just like the Earth does. The Earth rotates once a day. The sun takes 11 days to go around. Now, when the sun shrinks down to a smaller size, it still is spinning around. But it's just like the figure skater. You notice figure skaters, when they start to go around, they put their arms way out, and they go around sort of like this. If they want to go faster, they don't turn faster, they just pull their arms in and they start going faster. So you think they're making themselves go faster. They're not. It turns out if you're spinning and you become slimmer, then you spin faster automatically. Try it. <laughs> so what happens to a star that was spinning around once every 11 days? If you bring it down to six miles across, it's spinning around 30 times a second. 30 times a second. It's, try it yourself. It's spinning around. And that is 100 masses of our star spinning around 30 times a second. This is an amazing phenomenon. So there are things out there in the universe that we don't have. I mean, we don't have 100 million tons in a teaspoon on Earth. We don't have a lot of these monsters and beasts that are out there. That is one of the interesting aspects of astronomy, that you get to see things that aren't here. It's sort of like um, zoos used to be. Uh, explorers would go into Africa and they would get animals that had necks this long. Nobody had ever seen them before, so they'd bring them back home and tell the local folks about it. Oh, amazing. Well, we've got stars that spin around 30 times a second. I'm not going to bring one home and show you about it. I'm just going to tell you about it. They are there. Something sad is going to happen. When our sun shrinks down, to being the size of the Earth, it's not going to give out much heat. So you're going to get very, very cold. That is going to happen in five billion years. But you're not going to much care, because just before our sun starts to shrink down, it's going to make one last attempt at becoming famous. Before it starts to shrink, it's going to swell up. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. 
and it's going to turn red, not yellow any longer. It's going to get twice as big as it now is. It's going to get three times as big as it now is. It's going to get ten times as big as it now is. Do you know how big it's going to get before it stops swelling? It's going to get past the orbit of Earth. You watch. <laughs> so Earth will be inside the Sun. 3,000 degrees. Okay? So if you survive that, you're not going to much care when it starts shrinking back right now. Now this won't destroy the Earth because the Sun is actually very thin. It will continue to rotate around once every year at 3,000 degrees around a Sun that's now bigger than our whole orbit. It reduces the visibility and other things like that. But um, that's another amazing thing that's going to happen. And after that, the Sun then will go out. So some people say that's why we have to get these rocket ships so that we can go to other planets and continue the DNA and keep it going because this one has a limited lifetime ahead of us. In fact, maybe that's how we got here. Some other planet had to escape. So that could have happened too. Now the last point to point out to you is that you and you and you and you and you, you have all been inside a star firsthand yourself. When the universe started 15 billion years ago, I was there, <laughs> it only had what we call hydrogen atoms, very, very light atoms. And they would bump around and they'd find other hydrogen atoms and they would join together and they'd make a helium atom, which is our next lightest substance, agree? And then the helium atoms tried to bump around and join with other ones and make heavier atoms. And heavier and heavier atoms. But what was happening was that the universe was expanding and cooling. So they could not find other atoms to bump into. So that's all the material that we had at that time. Hydrogen and helium. But if you look inside your body, go ahead, take a look. Okay. You're going to see some potassium, you're going to see some sodium, a lot of carbon, a lot of oxygen. These things were not present in the beginning. They were not there at all. But yet they're now inside your body. So where did they come from? This is where they came from. That original hydrogen, and this is something we don't yet understand exactly how it happened. But we do know that this is what happened. This hydrogen grouped together into a huge cloud of hydrogen gas. And within that cloud, certain subregions from their own gravitational collapse started to collapse into a unit. This is where our sun came from. So you get this huge cloud of hydrogen gas and anything else that's out there, and it collapses of its own gravity into a tight object. Well, what happens when you compress something? Doesn't it get hotter? Try compressing your hand. Does it get warm inside? So when this huge ball of hydrogen gas, by its own gravity, shrunk smaller and smaller and smaller until maybe it was one one millionth of its size, then at the center of that ball, it got very, very hot. It got hot enough for nuclear reactions to ignite. And when the nuclear reactions ignited, they created the carbon and the oxygen and all the other things that you love so well. And you say, that's fine, but how did they get from the inside of that star into my body? Our sun, when it dies, is going to die with a whimper. It's going to die very quietly. It's going to get to be a little Earth-side star and just sort of sit there forever and ever and ever or longer. But when a big star dies, say a hundred times our star, it dies young and violent. It explodes. And when it explodes, everything that's in the center spews out. So all these carbon atoms, potassium atoms that it made, it throws back into space. It dies a hero's death. And it's spectacular. And when one of these giant stars explodes, you can see it in the daytime from the Earth. And every hundred years ago, we get to see one. And the Chinese, a long time ago, recorded one that they saw, too. They say, well, there was a star, a sun, in the daytime. It was only there three or four days, and then it went away. 
there was a star exploding, throwing its guts out. Look where they pointed. We see all of this debris from the exploding star. And we get to say, verify, yeah, yes, there was a star that exploded. <coughs> so when these potassium items and sodium and all these carbon and oxygen that you love so well get spewed back into space, then they mix and swirl where the hydrogen is already there. And then what happens is you get another collapse of a huge region. Only now when the collapse takes place, it's, it's not just hydrogen. It's enriched. Second generation stars have the output from the first generation star. And when they form a second generation star, they now have these elements in their cloud to collapse. And as they collapse on the way down to making the sun, then little planets break off. And these little planets now have the enriched vitamins and other things that you love so well too. So if you look inside your body and find a carbon atom, this carbon atom was not present in the early universe. This carbon atom is only one place in the entire universe that this carbon atom could have been made, and that's inside a star. And once it's made, it lasts forever. So those carbon atoms inside your body were born inside of stars. And you can feel them. So you've been there. Okay, Arlene asked me to say a couple of words about why we came here today. Um, this is supposed to be an exposure. Uh, in other words, the faculty today were supposed to expose themselves. <laughs> <laughs> expose the program <laughs> for people that might be interested in it, but might not know enough about that faculty member to take a chance on them, or wanted to know a little bit about their teaching style, or wanted to know a little bit about the contents of the course. So this UMUC Presents was aimed at addressing those questions. So we have had three of us give exhibi exhibitions, <laughs> exposures, about uh, those particular aspects uh, about what you might be looking for. And the new semester starts two weeks from Monday, and each of us will be presenting courses in our discipline. I'll be presenting an astronomy course where we will continue talking about these amazing facts. Dave is going to take you into theater, as you saw how great he was, and Melissa is going to continue into exploring the innards of the computer. I'd like to point also out also that Jill Roth is going to do the biologies, and anyone else in here would be there too. Now, the... Um, Right here, Dr. Oh, Yoko is going to do Japanese language. <laughs> Any of you want to improve your Japanese language also? Great, very much. Okay, so two weeks from Monday uh, is when we kick off the new uh, semester, and you can register for any of these courses over the next two weeks. And um, I, da, 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 Thank you, sir. Yeah. 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 Y
Good presentation. So we say goodbye in five, five billion years, huh? That's right. Just wait. <laughs> I know this, everybody's doing it. Oh, good, yeah, okay. That will be all that you know. Thank you. So next time, huh? Did you have did you have enough? Wow. Oh, did you? Later I will eat more. So, um, until what time you are, um, until what time? I'm good, thank you. Next week? Oh, yeah? <laughs> Say that again. I thought you 